more kind of ways we might think about it happening potentially. You might have the humans using uh, direct programming, which is you try and work out about intelligence and you design it logically. There are various uh, programs called uh, AGI or AIXI, and uh, I don't know what they all are. Anders will say more about some of them in a minute, I think. Uh, then there's brain emulation in which you spend time studying the brain and you use that to generate a superhuman intelligence because you put the same kind of algorithms that are in the brain, you put them in silicon and the silicon goes much faster than the brain and so you get it that way. Now Chalmers said that this is really hard and this is not extendable. He also spoke about learning and I can't you know, quite, quite admit, I can't quite remember what he said about that, but he spent most of his time in his talk talking about simulated evolution, which he said uh, is probably the best way in many ways to do this experimentation into super advanced intelligence and one reason is he said well that's how intelligence has arisen already it's arisen by evolution uh, it was a very slow and messy process but uh, we could uh, provide a better environment and we could uh, feed lots of things into this environment and potentially we didn't we don't mind if it's wasteful potentially you could get intelligence evolving through all kinds of a uh, uh, algorithms, neural networks, super neural networks, and so on. And so the suggestion here is that a virtual reality created and monitored by humans can be where superhuman general AI really comes into existence. And he made this more plausible by saying, well, this is actually the safest way in which we could play with intelligence because it's sort of locked up. It's in a leak-proof place. So instead of it happening in the real world where it might interact with us and then kill us, we put it inside a simulated world uh, a bit like the Matrix, you know, and David Chalmers famously has written many things about the philosophy of the Matrix, fine film, and in this uh, Matrix, some of you may remember seeing it, people have the opportunity to eat this red pill, and some will get out of the simulation and get back out to the real world with all the intelligence that he's learned in the simulation. And so the, this, to be safe, to avoid the super intelligences having dim views about us humans and regarding us as pesty ants or similar, we would have to stop them getting out, there would be no red pills, the AI can't get out of the box, and the AI would, wouldn't be able to speak to us either, because there is a fear that if the AI could speak to us, the AI would know about our psychology very well, and would give us all kinds of reasons why it would be better for us to let the AI out of the box against our better judgement. And so we have to, he, David Chalmers said, be no external input. So we could see what's going on, but the AI couldn't see what we're doing and couldn't uh, really understand what we're doing. Even though they're super intelligent, they just don't have enough in, uh, information about what we're doing, so it couldn't manipulate us. And the final thing he suggested, well, you have to keep an eye from the outside. You can either stop it altogether, and somebody put up their hand in the audience and said, well, if you stop it, isn't this a bit immoral? And he says, yeah, well, what you could do, you could just slow it down, turn down the dial. The anyway. Hmm? The clock speed. Turn down the clock speed, yes. And if the result is really good, so we do maybe thousands and thousands of these experiments, and we could look at some of these different, and if some of them is really good, what do we want to do? And Chalmers then spent some time talking about what well, we probably want to upload ourselves into this new world, you know, so that we get the benefits of the intelligence and we live in there. And then, I have to say, talking about what takeaways that some of us who went to this conference took, I have to say that I changed my mind about the plausibility that we might be living in this simulation. The idea is that uh, if we, smart humans, slightly smart humans, maybe cranky, weird, but anyway, if there are people who are thinking in terms that we could create intelligence by creating a powerful virtual reality in which there is leak-proof evolution of intelligence, uh, then maybe some other intelligence in some other place have the same idea and created our world and that we happen to be the emulation or the simulation. But I used to, I've heard of this argument many times, and I used to say, this is a bit silly, you know, I, I only believe it might be 1% likely. Uh, well, philosophers like Nick Boston have spent a fair amount of time writing about it. And I think after listening to David Chalmers, I think I'd pop this to me, I don't know, a bit more than 1% likely that we actually could be living in a simulation. And I'm not sure how ethical it is, you know, I'm not, but maybe these uh, super intelligences who have created us uh, may not be that ethical. Anyway, if you like this kind of idea, and this is a bit of a sideshow to the main talk, then uh, Greg Egan has written a science fiction, in fact, there are several science fiction books along these themes, uh, people living inside simulations, but this was particularly interesting. So I will finish, before I hand over, I will finish by summarizing uh, some of the things we might be worried about in the future with more and more technology. 
And what I'm doing here is I'm borrowing from another one of the speakers who was at the conference, uh, Peter Thiel, who is the co-founder of PayPal and one of the early investors in Facebook. So he was probably quite a wealthy man. And there were lots and lots of people lined up to ask him questions afterwards. <laughs> yeah, even more than lined up to ask questions to Ombre, I know this. So anyway, uh, so Peter Thiel had uh, dozens of people wanting to speak to him. And he said, you know, okay, we're talking about these future scenarios. What should we fear the most? Should we fear that the robots will become more intelligent and will kill all the humans and terminate the star? Is that something we should incredibly fear about? Should we be more worried about the outbreak of some uh, biological uh, disease? A new version of smallpox, a worse version of smallpox, perhaps uh, engineered by some uh, terrorists or uh, accidentally engineered and could go in to kill everybody. Uh, going to squeeze in a bit more. There might be some seats in another video somewhere, right? And that's kind of a traditional artificial intelligence view. But that requires a lot of understanding. What is vision? What is working memory? How do they mesh together? So we're going to need a lot of very complex information, but we're not going to need that much information. It, on the other hand, we can go down here. Imagine simulating every atom in the brain and their interactions. We know pretty well uh, how to simulate atoms. It's just that it takes a ridiculous amount of computing power when you have uh, the large amount of atoms that we happen to have in our heads. So that would be a very simple model, except that we would need some ridiculously good scanner to figure out where every atom is in a particular moment. Uh, so, down here, we don't need to understand very much high-level information, but we need a lot of computer power. Somewhere in the middle, it seems likely that we would actually have a sufficiently simple system that we could brute force it, and not necessarily need a ridiculous amount of computer power. So, roughly on the level of electrophysiology, which is already where we computational neuroscientists do a lot of simulations, and it might be feasible to do this. And uh, there are some interesting issues here, whether this might actually be possible in principle. Don't have the time for that. Uh, and there's some very interesting problem of, this is a typical electron microscope uh, scan of a piece of drain, brain tissue. We need to actually unravel this kind of information and turn that into something we can simulate on a computer. Which means figuring out where each of these things, well, they're parts of cells and they're going past each other in three dimensions. Which are, is connected to which? by which kind of contact, and what are the functional properties of that. So that is really a kind of fundamental, a very interesting neuroscience problem. And then of course we can get complications, again I don't have the time to get into this, there was a very lively debate with another delegate, Stuart Hamroff, who is very convinced that consciousness is a quantum mechanical thing, and we really need to go down on the microtubal level. I disagreed, sparks were flying during lunch. <laughs> Uh, fortunately, I got kind of help because Max Tegmark, the physicist, was there, and he's much better at arguing quantum mechanics than I am. So uh, that was fun. Uh, in the end, of course, none of us uh, budged. Uh, so uh, uh, Stuart is going to predict that we're not going to succeed, we're not going to succeed, and eventually uh, we're going to have to admit that we need to do something with those microtubules. I'm pretty convinced, on the other hand, that we're going to succeed, and uh, Stuart is going to have to say, yes, the brain is a kind of classical object. Complicated but classic. But you'll resolve this philosophical discussion by an empirical test. Yeah. To actually create the, or not, as the case may be, a brain that works. Exactly. So that would be fun. Uh, somebody's going to have to eat his hat. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, doing the scanning part, uh, right now I think uh, the scanning people are amazing. So just before we had the uh, the, the, the summit itself. I was at a dinner with uh, some of people involved. Kenneth Hayworth up at Harvard is doing some amazing work. He's got um, a, a system that slices up a small piece of brain tissue so you can scan on an electron microscope. And uh, there are various uh, things uh, they are doing that are producing simply amazing data sets. The problem here is you can either get very high resolution so you can figure out every little piece of the cells. Or you can get the chemical information about what's in these compartments, what the kinds of molecules are there. Or you can get large volumes. But right now we have no method that works for all three at the same time. So this is a bit of a challenge. So right now this kind of thing where you take a brain and you slice through it and you take a picture. This is macroscopic optic resolution. This is not going to give enough information to any function. So you need to go down to a lower resolution. But, uh, for example, using an optical microscope, you're not going to get more than the resolution of uh, light wavelength, which is a bit too large to resolve the finest connections, which is terribly annoying. But the electron microscopes are a terrible thing to the brain tissue they're scanning. 
Uh, we might hope that one day we're going to be able to do, use some kind of like a, mag a magnetic camera.